work in the most fundamental way. This conference is not only about virtual reality. There are many kinds of new technologies that have digital kind of, yeah, based on digital new possibilities. Augmented reality, mixed reality, new kinds of holograms maybe. I, we, will, we will ask Dado about that later. Um, but you know, now I'll sit down and I hope that your brain works again. No, I'll, I'll be fine, I think. Do you think virtual reality will change, um, change our lives radically? Um, yes, and an unqualified yes. Um, I think anything that allows you to escape from yourself, whether it's drugs or alcohol or opiates or broadcast television or anything, uh, we're always going to want that. And let me tell you about this first experience I did have with virtual reality. It was at uh, my living room in Vancouver, where I live, and I had some good friends over, and it was this beautiful July afternoon, and the light was coming through the leaves on the tree down by the... It's just gorgeous, perfect, perfect day in my favorite room on Earth. And there's this friend that works at Mozilla down in the Bay Area. And he brought up the most recent version of uh, Oculus. And I'd never used one before. And so I put it on. And uh, suddenly I was floating above a purple swamp in like, Louisiana and there's lights off in the distance, and you're sort of just going to sort of chase the lights like that, and a very, very, very simple experience. And then let's do another. And it was asteroid mining in well, Jupiter or Saturn or something, except you could only look. You couldn't really put your hands in or do anything. So altogether, it was maybe three and a half minutes. And then I took the goggles off, and I looked at the real world, and I thought, what a dump this place is. And then I realized, oh my God, this thing's going to win. There's no way it cannot win. The only caveats on the VR experience, and I think the guys here from Lausanne will probably know it, is that if you stop suddenly or uh, if you cut scenes, then it really affects your vestibular system and, and you feel seasick or you will puke. And, but there's also this thing called VR sadness, which is what I experienced. And people put these things on and they come out and they never quite return to the full world. And a part of them is sort of invested in this machine. Um, so, I mean, I, it's going to happen. I think it's mostly okay, but I have my doubts. So it's, a, it's an escapistic kind of technology. It will help us lead like drugs or alcohol or... Well, is it a negative thing, you think? Well, it's going to happen. I mean, it, it, VR is this asteroid that's going to hit the planet apparently in 2023. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, if I really had my act together, I, I'd be out there making a VR slasher movie or VR pornography or VR gaming or something. Because it's going to happen. There's going to be a first VR porno. There's going to be a first VR slasher film. Um, maybe our, the guest coming later on will tell us more about that. Um, so what are you going to do? You can't fight it. Uh, you try to understand it. Have you tried it yet? I have now tried it a little bit. What was your experience? Yep. I was similarly um, not shocked is not the right word and I didn't see wonderful things but I was actually, I looked at it with, with my friend here Dado at, at the Warner Brothers studio in London. Like cartoons? And there were Cartoons, and I don't really know what they were. I think Disney productions or something, but they were just so. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what was it? Yeah, but it was, you know, you turn around and there's a very large gorilla there, but like really large. Yeah. And there's a snake which is that close, and it's super naturalistic. So yeah. I, I was thinking, what is going to happen? These are, pr I presume, children productions. So what are going to happen to children? <laughs> with, if, you, if you grow up with that as a normal kind of uh, entertainment, not a little cartoon or a little book or something that, I, that 
we grew up with, but with hyper-realistic jungle scenes with crazy mega gorillas one millimeter away from you, you're going to be quite... You will grow up in a strange, with this strange kind of understanding of normal, what what's normal. Oh, you would, wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, I was saying yesterday that in the 1960s, uh, when hippies just suddenly appeared on the scene around 65, everyone was like, who are these people? Where do they come from? And, and that's, and people realized, oh, they came from television. And now we have millennials and they're coming out of the sort of the early internet era. And then you are going to have these next post-millennial, you know, maybe one, one and a half generations from now, who won't even really have a connection to the physical world, I don't think. And that, is it a bad thing? Maybe it, it's an evolutionary stage. Um, uh, but the illusionary, I mean, even if the effects are stronger, the, the wish to leave this world, isn't that basically what art and literature and theater and cinema and ever, all of this is about? So it's oh. not like a totally, I mean, isn't Hieronymus Bosch and Salvador Dali and, oh. you know, and you now take some heavy kind of stuff. Uh, isn't that just the same it, thing? It, I, I think it's actually a religious impulse to want to oh, exit yeah, your yeah. body. Um, I mean, the, I was upstairs in the lounge looking at my iPhone, you know, 30 years ago I would have been reading poems by Rilke. I mean, so something changed there. Um, but you can read Rilke on your iPhone. It's not the same. No. No. Um, so in terms of the escapist need, it, it's something everyone wants to do. Maybe we should be escape, um, figuring out why it is that we want to escape. Yeah, the escapistic kind of uh, tendency gets a strong vehicle here. Um, but oh, yeah. So you think it's a, a medium which is somehow stronger than others that will kind of or more or less dominate or kill all other mediums? Oh, it, it completely, it, it, it just overtakes your body, you're captured by it. It, it. it taps into the reptile part of your brain as well as the uh, frontal cortex and all your gravity systems. Uh, I think I said in the article, you know, when the doorbell rings and you're in VR, you're not going to be able to go out and like answer the door or something like that. You're really absolutely inside it. You're completely within it. I forgot to mention that Douglas is not only an author and a, a cultural critic and many things. He's also an artist and a designer. Plus, importantly here perhaps, you wrote a very interesting book on Marshall McLuhan. Yes. And now I remember yeah. that we had, a, a, as part of that, that was an easy way in for me somehow since I know so little about these things that I could yeah. ask questions that somehow relate to McLuhan, because him I did know a little bit about. Yeah. And he di distinguishes between hot and cold mediums. And uh, what is that again? Oh. And what is VR? I think VR is so, first of all, the hot, cold thing. I'm not quite sure, I, even after all these years, I'll even get that. But I'd say it's probably the hottest medium there is. <laughs> because it absorbs you totally. Completely, there, there's, yeah, no, there's nothing else you can do. Um, I, we're talking about Marshall McLuhan. Um, a lot of younger people don't know who he is, or if they do, they only have a very faint idea. He was this uh, English, er, English teacher in Toronto in the early 1960s, who at the age of 50 uh, began discussing uh, changes that are happening inside our minds, uh, our bodies, and societies. And through a chain of really weirdly unrelatable experiences, he uh, was able to uh, basically see the internet 50 years before it happened, uh, but he didn't know the correct interfaces. So if you reread him right now, you look and he'll be using uh, Yates or uh, uh, pamphleteers from the 18th century to describe what's basically uh, PayPal or uh, CNN, or uh, I'm continu continuing to read him because he's not correct just up to 2018, Daniel. He's probably going to go way further into the future. And I think that we're, if I continue to research him, we'll probably find out more about what VR is going to do to us. He, uh, uh, I mean, if, if virtual reality is going to change our lives, it will also change a sub category, small, but for very important for some of us, namely art. Yeah. And um, what do you think, I mean, now there are, 
people here in the room who are doing this, and we will yeah. listen to this this afternoon. But do you think it's an entirely new art form coming, or are there will it duplicate everything that has already been done and it's recreated in VR? Or what do you think is going to happen? Well, I mean, the sensory part of it is so overwhelming and so wonderful that you forget that we're probably going to have to throw some storylines in there too and have uh, new fables, new. Uh, uh, oh, as probably what Netflix is to TV, this is going to be to Netflix, perhaps, and, but even then a bit more saturated, a bit more intense. Um, it's, it is the future of narrative. Um, and I'm certainly looking at it and going, okay, what st story can you tell here that you can't tell anywhere else? And I think that probably there's going to be a lot of uh, James Cameron and, you know, what are those movies he makes with the people are blue? I wonder who's that? Amazon or mm -hmm. oh. Avatar? Amazon. I think that's the first direction. It's maybe going to go very big budget. Right. I mean, there are already virtual reality. Um, there's presence in the art world. I know the Tate did something now with the, with their Modigliano show, but that's not really art produced. At, that's that's a vehicle. That's a that's a a way to to make people know about the, the, the show or make people can watch it even if they don't go to the museum. Or, but, but art that is produced for or in or with this new medium has also started at the, at the Whitney Biennial, at last Venice Biennale, a, a little bit. It has many problems of practical nature that, yeah. you know, maybe these people here could all, we could show something here because we're a hundred people or something. Yeah. But with the big museums or biennials and stuff where there are hundreds of thousands, it's, it's very difficult. But, yeah. but there's something also with it that I wonder about you. I think we talked about this, but there's something a little bit um, autistic, solipsistic, isolated about it that, you know, you put on that thing and, and, oh, and yeah. your friends leave, are gone and, well and, and you feel you're great out there in Jupiter. But... Is that what we look, I mean, when, when you go to art shows, it's, isn't it fun to actually go with, I would love to walk through a museum with you and talk to you yeah. whilst looking at paintings, and this seems... People just look strange when they're wearing those goggles. There's no way around it, and whoever's designing them, like, that is the golden design ring of the next 20 years. Uh, they have to look like you're not being cocooned by a superior species, is what they have to look like. Um, so, I mean, you... I mean, that's you are the designer, so well, I maybe think you there, have but maybe actually, there yeah. is a way. Here's the thing, yeah. and maybe we'll find out. I've got them on, you've got them on, and we can actually go in the space together. And I think that's this new Steven Spielberg movie, Ready, Ready Player One, is about just that. And uh, I mean, if that was an app, like go through the Moderna Museum with Daniel Birnbaum, and that'd be kind of wonderful, actually. So maybe <laughs> we're, we're projecting isolation into a situation that could actually be very rich in shared experience. Of course, reading a novel is also a lonesome thing. It's a, it's a what what? A lonesome. You sit there and you read your own book and you're alone. Maybe books are overrated. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I just said that <laughs> I just said on live just streaming, <laughs> not international, whatever. <laughs> well, maybe books were just a necessary interim technology that r had to happen in order to get us to VR, and now we can get rid of our books. Yeah. Uh, your you're, you're, you're brains don't. are dribbling. I, know, I don't know what to say right exactly. Um, but beyond them being ugly, because I agree, it's yeah. very unattractive. This whole technology—they look silly, and you feel stupid, and and they actually you, and, and 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 people look kind of silly wearing them. Yeah. Uh, but that might change, I presume. Uh, that people, they will look like uh, ray Bans um, or uh, I don't know what. They'll figure it out. I mean, there's that fo photo I think most people have seen now, of. Uh, a commuter railway car going from the suburbs of London into the city, and every single guy, there's no women, is sitting there reading the same paper all at once. And so there you have another example of isolation within a crowd. Mm. Uh, but if they're all reading the same stories, then maybe they're basically wearing goggles together. I mean, it's people don't change, I don't think. They just take the same old behaviors and reinflect them in new ways. So, so I do think... Uh, that the aspect of VR that is being overlooked is the potential for a religious experience. And I think that's going to be quite wonderful. And I really, really look forward to that. Are you going to do things in VR? Well, I don't know. By 2023, uh, I might be retired in Arizona chasing waterfalls in my Tesla or something. I, 
I, I would like to. I, I, I think they have to get the haptic thing. The sen unless you can get your hands in there, it's not going to be a, a very satisfying experience. Um, but I think you guys are working on that already, right? See, it's going to happen. Um, maybe she'd start a studio, maybe. Um, is, how difficult is it? Just, I'm just sort of roping you in here early. Is it crazy difficult to film something and have it translate into the goggles? Okay. Okay. It's moving very quickly, I presume. That, but did you answer the question about, did I, uh, did, I'm not sure I understood what you said about the fact that, you know, at the museum we walk through and we are you're two or three people. In virtual reality, can one can share a space, no? Of course, it's just yeah. like doing a Google Doc or something. You can yeah. work on it together. But then I see you as, a, as an avatar in Well, there. Yeah. my avatar would definitely be in there. Yeah, yeah. not me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, so one can, it can be, it, does, it doesn't have to be a kind of a lonesome... No, it's, it's no. not about isolation. I mean, you could, you could, you know, investigate a space with someone in Antarctica if you're set up properly. Um, it's just that it looks so strange. Um, there, there was this. I think it was Pink Floyd or was it Led Zeppelin? They did this album cover done, designed by Hypnosis Studios back in the early '70s, and they took sort of '50s stock photos of. Uh, families or people in their car or whatever, and then they put this black object in it. And, uh, and it was insanely prescient. And you'd have this family and everyone's just sort of staring at this black thing. And I always wondered what it was. And of course, it ended up being these you know, things we live with. Um, uh, I think that things stopped being weird very, very quickly. And it's... Remember when Google sounded like a stupid word to say, and now it's just a word? Um, there's going to be a very awkward stage at the beginning, and I think there's going to be a sort of Bitcoin stage to it as well, as everyone tries to you know, jump in and you know, cash in as quickly as they can. Um, I don't think I've answered your question. But the mo I, I don't know anymore, but, but I, I would say yeah. the, the moment when it becomes a normal thing, a kind of a yeah. everyday device, is I guess the moment when it's totally wireless and yeah. also in your phone, I guess. Or yeah, and, uh, and, yeah. No one's and you just have it there, and 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 the and the glasses look like like Ray Bans or something else, <laughs> and yeah. you can and you just. Well. Otherwise, if you have to go to a special place, put on some ugly Googles with a huge computer, that's it's not so attractive. But I guess this all happens quickly now. We all look at you now, Dada, that yeah, you yeah. explain everything to us. Yeah. Um, So what would be, if you would, uh, uh, you know, we will, we will get a, 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 a talk very soon about EAT and there were these moments when, when, when artists or designers and people like you were invited to conferences and they were, they were given a chance to, to have a, a, a close relationship to people in the tech world? I, I know what you're saying. That what would you, wh like if you could just wish for something, what would it be? B okay, back in the 60s, as far as I understand, I think Michelle's going to talk more about it. Um, like, wow, we have technology. We've got some artists. Why don't you guys make art out of it? And uh, and there's a sort of an optimism about it, and a sort of like, you know, conquering a new continent, sort of. And now everyone looks at these machines, and it's kind of like, how can I make money out of this? Or like, um, how do I make it pay off? Or there, there doesn't seem to be the same will to make art out of it yet. And it might be just because the interface is so clunky. I mean, it's obviously going to happen. Um, uh, Hasn't the, the basic or the, the dominant trend in the art world been to, to be kind of skeptical of technology? That is something scary. And there are moments when that's not the case. I remember we were both in a conference about Les Imatriaux this um, show by Jean-François Lyotard, that, that had utopian, techno-optimistic tendencies, I think. They yeah. had both. And there are movements such as EAT, and there was the group in Germany called Zero, and way back in the early 20th century, we had Futurism, which was maybe naively optimistic about certain oh, yeah, just war machines and stuff. Craft work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But in general, we've been a little bit, uh, you know, in the art world at least, and you're 
partly in the art world, you're in many worlds, but yeah. people have been a little bit, you know, traumatized by technology. That is more a problem and a dangerous thing rather than a possibility. Um, well, it's 2029, the VR equivalent of the bicycle wheel on the chair is going to happen. And that's the exciting part, wondering what's it going to be? Yeah, what is that going what to is it gonna be? be? Yeah, so we're going to find out. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the Duchamp of the VR world is yet to emerge. That's correct. Yeah. Doug, I think we will kind of... I want to hear what these guys have to say. Like, forget me. I, I, I think no, no, we, 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 will, we will get you back into the conversation. Okay. So, so you're not totally free yet. But I think we will move on. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and thank you for being here with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. You know that.